Hi, welcome back. This is my third update for my data for this for 2020, and I'm a little behind on my updates. I originally hoped to have most of these updates done in January, but fate got in the way. In particular, I got distracted by the Teslas of the world and what's happening in the markets. But it's time for me to return to what the data tells me about 2019 and what might be coming up in 2020. In this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about risk and the price of risk. Let's step back. I mean, there are lots of definitions of risk, but the trade-off on risk is a very simple one. If you want to avoid taking risk, and it's a choice, you can, but you would have borne, on, at least in the, in the last decade, a, an astonishingly large cost for not taking risk. At the other extreme, if you said, look, I, don't, you know, I want to take every risk I can, you're behaving like a gambler, and as in casinos, only a bad end awaits you. So the middle ground on risk is that you accept that it's sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad one, and you think of it as a trade-off. For the right price, you are willing to take risk. In other words, if I offer you a sufficient return, sufficient reward, you'd be willing to take risk. So let's start with a very simple question. What is risk? I know there are as many definitions of risk as there are investors, but almost every one of the definitions I look at has has problems. In fact, I've heard risk defined as uncertainty. But basically, you're defining one nebulous word with another one. I don't think you're gaining much. I've heard risk defined as bad outcomes. And if you buy into the definition, risk is a bad thing, you're going to avoid it. And you're, you're fair game for anybody trying to sell you hedging products or insurance. In finance, I think we've become too narrow in our definition of risk. And we've let statistical definitions of risk stand in as risk. So I've heard finance, uh, f people in finance define risk as standard deviation or volatility, and I think we risk losing the essence of risk. So I think the best definition of risk I've seen, and I've been told that this, these symbols are not right, so not, uh, be patient with me, is the Chinese symbol for crisis. And the Chinese symbol for crisis is a combination of danger and opportunity. To me, this is the perfect definition of risk. Risk is neither good nor bad. It's a combination of danger and opportunity. And one way to think about this is you're willing to expose yourself to risk in, as long as you get opportunity to compensate. And that's what the price of risk is all about. So when you invest in a bond, the price of risk is the default spread you charge in the bond for the risk that you will not get paid back. But some people don't pay back their bond obligations. When you invest in equities, the risk premium you demand over and above the risk free rate is the equity risk premium, is the price of risk in the equity market. So in every risky market, there's a price of risk out there. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, are you okay with that price? Because that price is not the number you set, it's, it's set by the market. And for you to invest, that price has to be good enough for you. So let's take a look first at the default spread. The default spread is the easier of the prices of risk to measure because it's observable. And here I've looked at the default spreads on bonds with different ratings classes. It's true when we use ratings, we're using a shortcut to measure default risk because ratings agencies are often a little late to the game and they're sometimes biased, but it is convenient to have a measure of risk. So here I've looked at both S&P and Moody's ratings classes from AAA to D, and I'll start with the good news at least for ratings agencies. On average, the rating goes with default spreads. The higher rated you are as a company, the lower your default spread. So a typical AAA rated bond has a default spread of 0.63% at the start of 2020. A typical B rated bond has a default spread of about 1.56%. So at least on average, ratings measure default risk and default spreads go with them. The interesting thing is how much that number has shifted during 2019. At the start of 2019, if you look at the default spreads, they're all consistently higher than they were at the start of 2020. You're saying, why? Well, one of the things to factor in, the start of 2019, we're coming off a very bad quarter, a quarter where people were reminded about risk, and maybe that fed into those default spreads. They've come down over the course of the year. Now, if you take a lo longer-term perspective, default spreads do vary across time. In the U.S., the variance has not been huge except for 2008. That sticks out like a sore thumb you essentially will see during crisis periods, during e economic downturns, that the default spread tends to go up. And in good times, it tends to go down. So at the start of 2020, default spreads are down. People are feeling good about the economy. And you see that reflected in spreads. Now, let's take equity risk premiums. In my last post, I talked about the way most people estimate equity risk premiums. Just look backwards and to estimate a historical risk premium. 
I update these numbers at the start of every year, and this is my start of 2020 update to the historical risk premiums. A couple of problems here. One is, if you ask me what the historical risk premium is for the U.S., you'll see 12 different numbers depending on what slice of history I look at, whether I use T-bills or T-bonds, and even how I compute my averages. But I also argued in my last post that this is a, not a very good measure of an equity risk premium going forward because it's a backward-looking number. You're trusting in mean reversion, and you're trusting a number with a lot of noise in it. That's what the standard errors tell you. Of course, the pushback you get is, what choice do I have? I'd like a forward-looking dynamic premium. And at the start of every month for the last 12 years, and at the start of every year going back to the 1990s, I've been computing an implied equity risk premium. Now you're saying, what is that? Think of the implied equity risk premium as what I'm backing out based on what you pay for stocks. It's a yield to maturity on stocks. Because here's what I have. I know what you paid for stocks at the start of 2020, the S&P 500. I have the cash flows you'd have got in the last 12 months for investing in those stocks. And what I do is I project what those cash flows will look like based upon what, what analysts are projecting as growth in these companies for the next five years and beyond. So what you have here are my expected cash flows going forward, and I'm solving for a discount rate. In other words, I know what you paid. I know your expected cash flows. I'm solving for the discount rate I will need to make these cash flows, the present value of these cash flows, equal to the level of the index. That number works out to 7.12%. You're saying, what does that tell me? At the start of 2020, given what you paid for stocks and the expected cash flows, you can expect to make a 7.12% return on stocks. Saying, is that good enough? Relative to T-bonds, you're getting a premium of 5.2%, but the T-bond rate is low. Now, that, that, that equity risk premium becomes my spot estimate of what the premium was in January 1st, 2020. Just to give you a sense of how much that number shifted during 2019, it decreased over the course of 2019. What you see in this graph, the line is the S&P 500. So you better, you did one bad month in June, but in, in May. And but if you if you look at the rest of the year, it was pretty much a good year. As stocks rose, equity risk premiums drifted down. The green number is the equity risk premium. The red is the default spread. So over the course of the year, the expected return in stocks decreased. The equity risk premium went down, and the risk-free rate went down. You're saying, well, what does that tell me? To get a broader perspective, it's perhaps best to compare the premium at the start of 2020 to what it's been over history. So what you have in this graph are the implied equity risk premiums at the start of every year going back to 1960. So think of this the history of U.S. equities for the last 50 years, 60 years actually. So if you look across this entire time period, the average implied equity risk premium was about 4.2%. You're saying, what does this all do for me? Now, when you look at the implied equity risk premium of 5.2%, I'm going to argue that that number, in a sense, captures what you think about the market going forward. If you're a market bear, you think stocks are overpriced and it's a bubble, you're essentially telling me that the risk premium you're getting is too low. 5.2% is too low a number. If you're a market bull, you're telling me it's too high a number, that it's going to go down. And if you're market neutral, you're saying, I'll take the 5.2%. To give you a little bit of perspective, that's what this graph does. It tells you whether 5.2% is a high or a low number. And relative to history, 5.2% is closer to the higher end of the range rather than the lower end. So this graph is actually a consolation price for those who feel, okay, our market's okay. It looks okay, with one caveat. The risk premium is high because risk-free rates are low. So if you buy into the notion that risk-free rates are going to shoot up once the Fed or central banks step off the gas, then you could make the argument that stocks are overvalued. But basically, your argument is not about stocks. It's about the bond market being overvalued, that interest rates are too low, that they're going to go up. But at least based on historical equity risk, 5.2% is actually closer to the upper end of the spectrum ra rather than the lower end. Now, you're saying you can compute this equity risk for the bond market, you can compute the stock market, but can you compute it for other markets? Any risky asset market has a risk premium. It's just much more difficult in some markets to compute it than others. Take real estate. Real estate is a huge market, especially if you count in real estate that's not traded. Your house, your apartments, people's housing. If you look across real estate, there is a number out there that is a measure of expected 
return on real estate. It's what's called a cap rate. It's what real estate developers demand as a rate of return when they invest. The way a cap rate works is if you have a property with $10 million in expected income next year and your cap rate is 8%, your expected price for the property, the value that you attach to the property will be the $10 million divided by 0.08. So it's an expected return on stocks. If I subtract out the risk-free rate from it, I'm getting a real estate risk premium, right? So here's what I've done in this graph. I've computed the real estate risk premium as the green line and there's an interesting story to be told here. If you look in the 1980s, that number was actually negative. You think, that's absurd. Why would I accept less than the risk-free rate? Remember the pitch that you heard about real estate being a weapon of diversification, especially coming into the 80s and that inflationary decade of the 70s, we were taught that if you had your money in stocks and bonds, investing in real estate would diversify, hedge your portfolio, acting as a hedge against inflation. And when you're buying a hedge, what you know what? You're buying insurance. That's what that low-risk premium is. But this graph, if you look at the rest of the graph, tells an even more interesting story. Starting in the mid-90s, you start to see the real estate risk premium start to behave like the stock and the bond premium. Real estate is starting to behave like, finance, like a financial asset. And this is, in a sense, bad news for those who thought that their house would hedge them against a drop in the market. That is no longer true. A year in which your stocks and bonds melt down are also going to be a year in which your house price also drops. So the old notion that real estate is going to diversify a portfolio, I don't think it's as solid anymore. And you have to look elsewhere for diversification. The advantage of having risk premiums across different markets and putting them on the same, grave, uh, same graph is you can then make asset allocation decisions based on where you think you, you get the biggest bang for your buck. So the markets start to diverge. You want to leave the low risk premium markets and go to the higher risk premium markets because that's where you get the biggest payoff to taking risk. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is the debate about equity risk premiums is not an abstract one to be had in uh, ivory towers. This cuts to the core of what you think about markets. If you are like me, market neutral, you're effectively taking the equity risk premium as it exists today and using it as the right premium in valuing companies. If you're a bear, your argument is equity risk premiums are going to get higher. Why are they going to get higher? Because they become too low. They become too low because risk-free rates are, 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 are too low. And when they go up, your equity risk premiums have to rise. Or because there's fundamental reasons, whether it's a coronavirus or something else, it's going to cause risk premiums to go up. If you're a bull, your story is one of declining equity risk premiums, perhaps based on mean reversion or continu continued economic growth. But this is at the heart of the argument about markets. The only note of caution I would add is if, whether you're a bull or a bear, if you decide to build those views on equity risk premiums into every evaluation, every evaluation you do will jointly reflect both what you think about the company and you think about the market. And that's a dangerous place to be. So the bottom line is there is a price of risk out there that the market has set. You could be happy with it or you might not be. But it is what it is and you need to know it before you embark on investing. Thank you very much for hanging in there with me.